Um, we have a couple of complaints here about the way our government is treating our citizens, and that's not a new topic these days, but um, the regulatory bodies, of course, I'm convinced are really coming down on all of us are writing for growth hormone. There's a lot of debate about that around here, but simply I quit writing for it, and that's quite some time ago. Um, legal or not, I just don't want to be involved in it. And so I've converted over to doing the what I call the ungrowth hormone replacement therapy. Remember years ago, the 7-Up commercials, the, remember the brother with a lemon or lime or whatever, and he called it the Uncola. So I call this the ungrowth hormone replacement therapy. Fortunately for us, it's far better to restore hormones than just replace it, and that's what we're learning to do now. As we all know, every time you move up a level of command, we do better in the body, and that is certainly the case here. I don't think that she has. Pardon me just a second, folks. I think we have a mistake with the lecture here. Yeah. Pardon me. Yeah, thank Dr. Don Steele for that joke. Anyways, here's the, here's the proper lecture now. Anybody wants the new stuff, it's right here on this memory stick. Okay, here's a storm that's coming for the doctors that are prescribing growth hormone these days. I'm just not doing it anymore. I wish the regulatory bodies would just simply get out of the way because, frankly, they're, they're doing a lot of damage to the health and happiness of the, uh, of the population. You notice when the politicians bring in so-called medical experts to, to talk about something, they only bring in doctors who are against what we do. Isn't that true? They never bring anybody that actually knows what they're talking about. Anyways, luckily for us, it's far better to restore than to replace, and that's what we're talking about today. So everybody knows about growth hormone, right? Everybody agrees that if you have low growth hormone, even low normal growth hormone, it compromises your health and your happiness, right? If you don't know that, welcome day 4M. So anyways, it, it's released in a pulsatile fashion, very short half-life. It's inhibited by somatostatin. We're going to talk about that a little more. Basically, IGF-1 is a biomarker. And we can restore growth hormone in the capable, unless you have an empty silica. The problem with growth hormone, besides the regulatory interference, is the fact that it's so darn expensive. There's a possible ta tachyphylaxis for prescribing it uh, too long a period. And um, you actually may get disease atrophy of the pituitary after extended periods of time. So growth hormone is regulated by this trinity, growth hormone releasing hormone, ghrelin, and somatostatin. Now, you see the peaks at the top, the dark circles. Those are the young folks, like most of us. And you look at the older folks at the bottom, how much lower their, um, their growth hormone production is. And of note, the pulsatile production, and two, is the, um, the, the, the decrease in the variability of the growth hormone production as we age. Variability is part and parcel of being, being young. And that's why, for instance, I use transdermal testosterone as opposed to using injectable. Transdermal testosterone, because its variability in the serum, mimics the hormones of a young man. Testosterone cypionate mimics the hormones of an old man. I think we should be looking towards the young man. So somatostatin, which is also known as growth hormone inhibiting hormone, or somatostatin release inhibiting factor, like SRIF, is produced by the hypothalamus and other tissues. We're going to look, just look at the hypothalamus now. Inhibits growth hormone synthesis and release. But on top of that, it also makes hypothalamus resistant to stimulation by the growth hormone releasing hormone that the body's endogenously producing or what we're going to be supplementing with if we use the somerillin. So on the other hand, somatostatin is responsible for that pulsatile release. Every time you see the, the serum levels of growth hormone dropping, it's the effects of somatostatin coming up. So and of note also is a fact that it decreases the number of somatotrophs but not the amount of growth hormone product produced by each and the somatostatin increases as we age, so it's really a double whammy. So, so we have endogenous growth hormone releasing hormone, which is, again, produced by hypothalamus, and it stimulates growth hormone synthesis and release. That's why it's called growth hormone releasing hormone, mostly release. It binds to its own receptor in the pituitary. It unfortunately has a short half-life. It, as opposed to somatostatin, increases the number of somatotropes and the amount of growth hormone from each. It's pretty good stuff. Now, of note, there's no downregulation with supplementation. So there's your pathway, so we want to uh, study such things. So now we're on to Semerillin, uh, also known as Jerif. 
It's semerolone acetate. It is the business end 29 hormone or uh, amino acid chain from the original uh, 44. It has a relatively short half-life. You can use it IV or sub-Q. Um, I'm injecting it sub-Q, uh, QHS. Uh, when you, problem is that by the time you get to an effective dose, um, we're going to talk about that more in just a minute here, the cost is approaching that of growth hormone. We'll, um, let's just say the results have been disappointing. However, it is vulnerable to physiological feedback, whereas the growth hormone placement therapy is not. So this is not a new thing. We've been using it for 30 years. There's tons of data on it. That's why we know it upregulates its own receptor, which is really nifty. There is some antibody formation, but that's transient, and so far as we know, not neutralizing. And one thing I find, almost every single one of my guys that put on say they sleep much better. Actually, it's working sleep some of the brain. I've had a couple guys with paroxysmal reactions, just give it to them a little early in the evening, but almost every guy, the first thing he tells me, gosh, Doc, am I sleeping better now? And that's wonderful. So um, I'm not in a position here where I can use my laser pointer, unfortunately, but um, um, here you see the growth hormone production after giving growth hormone replacement, uh, growth hormone release hormone infusion. And you can see that it really picks up the, uh, the pulse of that. Now, of note, when you inject growth hormone, basically you get a square wave of growth hormone, and that's it for the rest of the day. The advantage with using growth hormone releasing hormone, as some realin, is that you get harmonics throughout the day. So even if you are not producing an IGF-1 level, as high as you were with the original growth hormone replacement therapy, it's okay because the area under the curve is still superior to the harmonics that the growth hormone uh, uh, releasing hormone is producing. So... I just want to make a quick note about CJC-1295. This is a long-acting growth hormone releasing hormone, and this is where we're going, gang. We can't use it yet, but when we, when we can, I believe we all will. It extends out to a very long half-life, and that will dramatically increase growth hormone production. I'm not getting slides, but again, I can't use my laser pointer from this angle, but anyways. Um, the uh, CJC-1295 has what they call a drug affinity complex that covalently and powerfully bonds to albumin. And so it really brings out the half-life of uh, basically of semerillin. So as soon as we can use that, um, I'm going to be on it.